Well, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Bolton Lodge of the Theosophical Society during this lockdown, during these difficult times. Um, before I start, I'd like just to mention that one of our members, Donald Atkinson, has just passed on. He was a man of great knowledge, great spiritual knowledge. He knew his theosophy inside out and he gave some really good talks during his life. And he was sorely missed by everyone. He was always at, probably at every conference and most meetings. Um, he was very, very... He loved his theosophy. He was very, very keen on his theosophy. But he's passed on to higher realms of being and he will return, definitely. In his next life he will be carrying on the good work that he did in this life. So bear him in mind when we do our little meditation in a moment. But first I'll, I'll light the candles of harmony. So remember to keep the harmony within your hearts all through this meeting and afterwards into your daily life. These lights represent the, the light that we have within our hearts. In the Bhagavad Gita he said the spirit should, should be like a, a candle in a spot free from wind. That's where the mind should be. Calm, tranquil. So I like the candles of harmony. I'll sound the singing bowl, and we'll have. Uh, I'll just just ring it like a bell, and then we'll have a period of meditation, and then when I ring it again. The meditation's finished. Okay, so this afternoon's talk is called The Beacon Light of Truth. In her article, Le Feu de l'Inconnu, or The Beacon Light of Truth, H.P. Blavatsky writes, The Beacon Light of Truth is nature without the veil of the senses. 
can be reached only when the adept has become absolute master of his personal self, able to control all his physical and psychic senses by the aid of his seventh sense, through which he is gifted also with the true wisdom of the gods, Theosophia. And later in the same article, the beacon light upon which the eyes of all real theosophists are fixed is the same towards which, in all ages, the imprisoned human soul has struggled. The beacon whose light shines upon no earthly seas, but which has mirrored itself in the sombre depths of the primordial waters of infinite space, is called by us, as by the earliest theosophists, divine wisdom. It is this quest which is mirrored in all the great legends and fairy tales around the world. Most concern a quest for something, the Holy Grail, the Golden Fleece, or the hand of a beautiful princess, all symbolising the quest to realise divine wisdom and the trials and tribulations of the path to reach this goal. The Irish Theosophical writer A.E. George William Russell wrote, It is true that men have done wrong, hence their pain. But back of all this, there is something infinitely soothing, a light which does not wound, which says no harsh thing, even although the darkest of spirits turns to it in its agony. For the darkest of human spirits are still around him, this first glory, which shines from a deeper being within, whose history may be told as the legend of the hero in man. <clears throat> what we need is that this interior tenderness shall be elevated into seership, that what, what in most is only yearning or blind love shall see clearly its way and hope. To this end we have to observe more intently the nature of the interior life. We find indeed that it is not a solitude at all, but dense with multitudinous beings. Instead of being alone, we are in the thronged highways of existence. <clears throat> For our guidance when entering here, many words of warning have been uttered, laws have been outlined, and beings full of wonder and terror and beauty described. Yet there is a spirit in us deeper than our intellectual being, which I think of as the hero in man, who feels the nobility of its place in the midst of all this, and who would fain equal the greatness of perception with deeds as great. So, as said in theosophical literature regarding meditation, we have this inexpressible yearning of the inner man or woman to go out towards the infinite. In our moments of seeming solitude, we are in fact more in the presence of beings on higher planes than when in com company with others and our mind distracted by things on a lower plane. So we are more in company when alone than with friends or family. Although, of course, we have to be in a meditative state of mind and even then we, we may not be aware of others of other, and other presences, except perhaps deep within our minds, which may manifest in a feeling of peace and contentment. We are in fact in tune with our highest self, which automatically puts us in contact with others in the same state, which is a true community of souls. So light is always comforting to us, whether it is the light, the light of the sun, the moon, the stars, or even the soft light of our homes, or the artificial light of a city or town. Deeper still is the inner light, which we think of as 
of us enlightenment or we talk of throwing light upon a subject or a problem. Light is the same on all levels of being but it seems to differ because of its interaction with our different vehicles down to the lowest where it becomes physical light. The ever-changing intensity and tone of light in varying weather conditions and as the day passes at different times of the year can have a definite effect on the consciousness of the person involved in the viewing and experiencing of these changes. Sometimes in autumn, particularly, a cloudy day can produce a mellow light that gives rise to a beautiful melancholy that far from being negative has a very positive effect on the mind and emotions of any individual who is in the slightest bit sensitive to such things, making us aware of what the Japanese call mono no aware, or the poignancy but beauty of the transience of physical existence, but also the wonder and assurance of the immortality of life itself. We can all understand that a bright sunny day lifts the spirits of the majority of people, but this is subtly different, not just as regards the seasons, but also the months. The effect of sunlight on a spring day is not the same as the effect it has in summer, autumn and winter, or in early, mid or late stages of these. Nor is a cloudy or rainy day experienced at the same at different times of the year, and has a widely varying ambience, also depending on the person experiencing it. Twilight has a definite, indefinable magic, very special. Folklore says this is the time that the fairies come out to play, and we can see and feel the magic of this time of day. No other time has such an effect on our state of mind when the veil between worlds seems so nebulous and if we feel, feel it a great beauty steals into our hearts and colours everything with tenderness. All too briefly, but in ways that take root in our very souls. Writing about this special time George William Russell again says, For the future, we intend that at this hour the mystic shall be at home. Less metaphysical and scientific than is his want, but more really himself. It is customary at this hour, before the lamps are brought in, to give way a little and dream, letting all the tender fancies day suppresses, rise up in our minds. Whether it is spent in the dusky room or walking home through the blue evening, all things grow strangely softened and united. The magic of the old world reappears. The commonplace streets take on something of the grandeur and solemnity of starlit avenues of Egyptian temples. The public squares in a mingled glow and gloom grow beautiful as the Indian grove where Sakuntala wandered with her maidens. The children chase each other through the dusky shrubberies. As they flee past, they look, look at us with long remembered glances. Lulled by the silence, we forget a little while the hard edges of the material, and remember that we are spirit. So children look at the world with wonder, but are too young in mind to express these feelings to others in words, except perhaps in exclamations of joy or awe. As we grow, we lose this vision and begin to intellectualise everything. We grow cold. But if we develop the spiritual, poetic side of our nature, then we enter a second kind of childhood, but on a different level entirely. The Zen saying that at first a mountain is just a mountain, 
then later we see it is not really a mountain, but in the end it is just a mountain again, which is an expression of this process. We regain the innocence, the wonder, but with the added experiences we have been through to reach that point. Just like the journey of life from unconscious perfection through a consciousness of our imperfection to finally realise our perfection consciously. That's if there ever really is perfection. Maybe it's all just relative. As above, so below. So for most people, the, react, the, the reaction to the effects of life on all levels becomes stunted. We have to regain the childlike state we have lost, as the spiritual teachings tell us. Now, an encyclopedic definition of a beacon is to help guide navigators to their destinations. Types of navigational beacons include radar reflectors, radio beacons, sonic and visual signals. Visual beacons range from small single pile structures to large lighthouses or light stations and can be located on land or on water. Lighted beacons are called lights. Unlighted beacons are called day beacons. But we are looking for that light which never shone on land or sea, but which helps to us navigate the vast ocean of divine wisdom towards our destination or the different stages of a never-ending journey, never-ending as far as we know. The legend of Parsifal in Wagner's opera expresses this light of the grail, and Alice Leighton Cleaver and Basil Crump in their book on the opera, Parsifal, express the final moments in this way. A ray of light descends upon the cup, which glows with an intense lustre, and as Parsifal elevates it, the white dove of the grail, emblem of the Divine Spirit, floats down from the dome and hovers over its messenger. Kundra, who was a kind of witch in the story, with eyes ever fixed on her Redeemer, falls lifeless at his feet. Desire is dead, and the low, deceptive, illusory powers of nature are dispelled by the light of truth. No grander figure was ever depicted than that of Parsifal, as he stands the embodiment of compassionate love before the adoring brotherhood, the living link between them and the fount of divine love, whose light and power now radiate upon them from the cup he holds aloft. So here we have some feeling of that sense of wonder and awe, so important in our quest, and which was always emphasised in the great stories and legends throughout the world. As Roald Dahl said, those who don't believe in magic will never find it. And those who don't keep this sense of innocent wonder and have a poetic view of life will never catch a sight of this beacon light, the beacon light of truth. For the Master K.H. said that the true seer is always a poet. Whether it be Jason and the Argonauts, the Grail at Nights, Ulysses or Perseus, or many other legends and fairy tales from around the world, they all achieve their goal by making it their own only real interest. They allowed nothing to stand in their way. They overcame seemingly unsurmountable odds by focusing their whole attention on the object of their quest. Some fell by the wayside, but the brave triumphed. Krishna tells us in the Bhagavad Gita that if we focus our attention upon him, we will surely come to him. It is the surest way that we think of Krishna as the higher self. So relating this to our lives, we must take the stance that we are immortal beings. In essence, our personal selves come and go, but what we are in reality never changes. Some of the best words regarding the correct attitude are in The Voice of the Silence by H.P. Blavatsky. And these are amongst my favourite lines in any, any scripture, I think. 
in any tradition. And it says, Have patience, candidate, as one who fears no failure, courts no success. Fix thy soul's gaze upon the star whose ray thou art, the flaming star that shines within the lightless, lightless depths of ever being, the boundless fields of the unknown. Hath perseverance as one who doth for evermore endure. That's wonderful. Have perseverance as one who doth for evermore endure. Thy shadows live and vanish. That which in thee shall live forever, that which in thee knows, for it is knowledge, is not a fleeting life. Tis the man that was, that is, and will be, for whom the hour will never strike. Will never strike. So, the shadows are our personal selves, that come and go like these fleeting shadows. In the vast scale of things, our few short years in this particular life is like the Zen saying, that our physical life is like a galloping horse glimpsed through a crack in the wall. It was very, very graphic, <laughs> the galloping horse glimpsed through a crack in the wall. All of us on this inner pilgrimage, we're all together on this inner pilgrimage. We must find our way along the often misty roads that lead us through the sometimes beautiful and often harsh terrain that we traverse on our journey. We meet many friends and teachers on the way, and have countless adventures and perilous ordeals. But our inner resolve propels us ever onwards, and always the sun lights our way. Even if it disappears behind the clouds of our own making, we know it is still there, and will return in time, and it is true that even those clouds are silver-lined, holding the promise of better days and times to come. In the darkness, the moon borrows its light from the sun and gives us some comfort until the dawn casts its spell over our world and hope grows strong in us. Then comes the moment we hear the rushing of the river of life and reach the bridge we must cross. We will feel, feel the thrill of knowing that this is the consummation of all our efforts over many lives and that soon the dreams and nightmares will have passed and we will be faced with a great choice that we all must take in time, but which will ultimately end in our release and the general uplift of humanity as a whole. The Light on the Path by Mabel Collins tells us that, for within you is the light of the world, the only light that can be shed upon the path. If you are unable to perceive it within you, it is useless to look for it elsewhere. It is beyond you, because when you reach it, you have lost yourself. It is unattainable, because it forever recedes. You will enter the light, but you will never touch the flame. So, with it, so we may reach our goal, only to find out that what we thought was the end is really just a beginning as far as we know, there is no end to the quest. The sun lights our way, not just the physical sun of course, but that inner sun that illuminates the path for us onto the endless end. So on the way we help each other. We understand the limitations of human nature and are willing to forgive not seven times, but seventy times, seven times and always to pass the gentlest sentence possible upon those who err. We learn that the journey is not really a solitary one, but taken with all our fellow pilgrim, pilgrims, our fellow seekers, and that we always have the good of humanity as a whole in our minds, as we progress onwards. But in a way, progression is an illusion, as we are already there. We just need to clear away the clouds that obscure our vision and prevent us from seeing 
the ever-shining sun of our inner being. So the tales we read about various heroes in different cultures may be regarded as symbolic of this spiritual journey that we all embark upon in time. In the Sleeping Beauty stories, the prince who can be said to represent the questing mind battles through dangers, including brambles, that he must cut through. That may, these may represent the entanglements that threaten to engulf our minds. And finds the princess who represents the spiritual nature, Atma Buddhi, which is dormant or sleeping in us, until she receives the kiss and awakens. Then the two are united in love, so the mind becomes Manasa Tajasa, we say in theosophy, which means the illumined mind. Many other tales, like the quest for the Holy Grail or the Golden Fleece, which we enjoy reading because of the triumph of the hero at the end, resonate with our own individual quests. In our life, we come up against many problems. For some people, these are very serious, for others less so, according to our karma and our stage of development. But we have this inner power to overcome all of these if we are at least somewhat awakened to our true nature. And if we are fixed resolutely on this spiritual journey. I think the archetypal images react on our consciousness and the success at the end by the heroes fires our imagination and our inspiration and gives us the encouragement to go through everything. So they are more than just stories to entertain. As we read the story or watch the film, we feel that rush of excitement and satisfaction at the final outcome. That's why a modern obsession with anti-heroes who are as bad as the villains and sometimes worse, and with grisly murders and serial killers, is a symptom of the material nature of society and is the work of forces trying to undermine the spiritual progress of humanity. That's why I do tend to like superhero films and um, because they are the triumph of good over evil and we have this hero who can represent the divine nature that we all have, who's, who's fighting against the evil forces. Um, so the superhero is another, is another archetype, it's a modern version of Jason and all these other people. Um, Hercules, Hercules and all these other people from, the, from Greek and Roman, Ch Chinese, Japanese mythology, etc. If we can begin to see that all that happens to us is for a purpose, then we can make all of our life experiences, which we designate, designate good or bad, signposts or pointers on the road to our own her holy grail. Love and compassion will soften the very atmosphere around us and bless the hearts of all we come into contact with. The strongest weapon we have is love, pure love, which can overcome most obstacles providing it is pure love. This is what inspires the heroes of tales like The Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, and brings about transformation in stories like Beauty and the Beast. Love overcame the, transformed the beast back into the handsome prince. Seeing, seeing beyond the outer form to the divinity within, Victor Frankenstein created a monster that had a poetic heart. In fact, in the TV series, Penny Dreadful, he called himself John Clare, after the Victorian poet. He loved poetry, art and music, but because of his, his hideous appearance, everyone feared him, and this caused great torment, as he only needed love and understanding. I also recently watched a play called Frankenstein at the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester, which showed this inner torment very efficiently. The lesson of this is that we must always look for the divinity in others. We don't know what torments others are going through. But we should never judge lest we be judged, as the Bible says. And we should never be deceived by appearances. Also, we also may have these inner torments, so we have to come to see the real self that remains unchanged through everything.
a student of Tendai, Tendai which is a philosophical, philosophical school of Buddhism, came to the Zen abode of Gassan as a pupil. When he was departing a few years later, Gassan warned him, Studying the truth speculatively is useful as a way of collecting preaching material. But remember that unless you meditate constantly, your light of truth may go out. Your light of truth may go out. Our efforts should be concerned on developing our intuitions. What we understand with the intellect is not sufficient to achieve our Holy Grail. They give us signposts on our journey, but they are in the realm of concepts, and we must in the end go beyond concepts to really understand. Remember what I quoted from HPB at the beginning of this talk? The beacon light of truth is nature without the veil of the senses. It is vision at its purest, without the interpretation that the senses put upon it. It is clear see it say is seeing, clear seeing. HPB again wrote, No human born dogma, no institution, however sanctified by custom and antiquity, can compare in sacredness with the dogma of nature. I don't exactly know what the dogma of nature means. But it means the, um, you know, with, I just take it to be nature itself. The key of wisdom that unlocks the massive gates leading to the arcana of the innermost sanctuaries can be found hidden in her bosom only. In her bosom only. Divine wisdom free from any traces of dogma foisted on us by religion or education or politics helps us to see our way more clearly and to relate to others as fellow pilgrims. The low mind has created the world we live in now with all its institutions, politics and religion as mentioned. We are managing to shut out the voice of nature and even actively destroying it. It is a return to nature on her many levels that will be our redemption. We as a society have been busily shutting out an intuitive perception of our true self by filling the mind with conceptual ideas and ideas that only give us insight into our lives in a materially orientated society. Even religion and spirituality is watered down to fit in with our material lifestyle by many, it's just an addition to the many possessions in life. Maybe this is, all, this is okay for them at their stage. And maybe it is a st stepping stone. We don't know. We can't judge. But still, most of us retain this link with nature. That's why we love go to go walking in the countryside or by the sea. We feel the healing power of nature, even at its most physical level. The image and archetypes in the Grail legends and other tales from around the world take us into another dimension of our being, open our minds to other worlds within us and have a powerful effect on our consciousness, making us aware that there is more to life than the humdrum everyday routine. There is magic, there is beauty and there is love. It is easy to think of these tales as just fantasy and just means to entertain. But H.P.B. H.P. Blavatsky writes in an article, The Sign of the Times, Works of fiction, the various novels and romances, are called fiction in the arrangement of their characters and the adventures of their heroes and heroines. Admitted. Not so. As to the facts presented, these are no fiction, but true presentiments of what lies in the bosom of the future, and much of which is already born, may, may be corroborated, nay, corroborated by scientific experiments. We are children of the light. We are born and grow in it. And as it grows stronger in us, it lights up many things that were in the darkness gives us a more enlightened view of life and all of all those that we share this planet with. Not 
just you know, the human beings, but other animals, plants, other life forms. We walk the same ground, but something changes gradually. Our perception widens and our attitude transforms because the mists are starting to clear and we can sense the sun breaking through at last and all the associations of light, as I mentioned earlier, dispelling darkness, physically and spiritually, as above, so below. The German mystical writer Novalis writes, Before all the wondrous shows of the widespread space around him, what living sentient thing loves not the all-joyous light? With its colours, its rays and undulations, its gentle omnipresence in the form of a wakening day. The giant world of the unresting constellations inhales it as the innermost soul of life and floats dancing in its blue flood, the sparkling ever tranquil stone, the thoughtful imbibing plant and the wild burning multiform beast inhales it. But more than all, the lordly stranger with the sense-filled eyes, the swaying walk and the sweetly closed melodious lips. Like a king over earthly nature, it rouses every force to countless transformations, binds and unbinds innumerable alliances, hangs its heavenly form around every earthly substance. Its presence alone reveals the marvellous splendour of the kingdoms of the world. Not many people write like that nowadays. Novalis is one of my favourite writers. He died very young, I think he was only in his late 20s, I think, when he died, in the Victorian times, I think. All our lives can be an adventure, a quest to reach our holy grail. The struggles we go through, the heartaches and joys are all grist for the mill. If we develop the right attitude, we can make use of all our experiences that come our way to, to help us on our way. When we look at the world, we should imagine we're on a mountain, looking down at all that goes on. The lower mind has created so many divisions between countries, religions, sects, political parties and even families and individuals. Yet we are all the same within. Remember that, particularly nowadays with what's going on in the world. We are all the same within. All these outer differences are just the great dire heresy of separateness that weans us from the rest, as the voice of the silence tells us. We are on a small planet, one amongst countless others, yet we still cannot get on with each other. We allow illusion and delusion to keep us apart, building walls instead of bridges, seeing others through our own misconceptions and misunderstandings, failing to make allowances for the limitation of human nature, forgetting to cast the beam out of our own eye before we criticise the splinter in the eyes of another. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone, etc. If we want all the people of the world to get on with each other, then certainly we must show the way the best we can. The world needs to come to understand what reality is. That there is no religion higher than truth. That all these man-made religions and philosophies lead just cause so much grief and engender hatred. The opposite of what they should be doing. Brotherliness and sisterliness just for members of their own religion and a desire to convert others by whatever means. Again, H.P. Blavatsky writes, In our humble opinion, the only essentials in the religion of humanity are virtue, morality, brotherly love and kind sympathy with every living creature, whether human or animal. This is the common platform that our society offers to all to stand upon. The most fundamental differences between religions and sects sinking into insignificance before the mighty problem of reconciling humanity, of gathering all the various races 
into one family and of bringing them all to a conviction of the utmost necessity in this world of sorrow to cultivate feelings of brotherly sympathy and tolerance, if not actually of love. Having taken for our motto, in these fundamentals unity, in non-essentials full liberty, in all things charity, in all things charity, we say to all collectively and to everyone individually, keep to your forefathers' religion, whatever it may be, if you feel attached to it. Brother, think with your own brains, if you have any. Be by all means yourself, whatever you are, unless you are really a bad man or a bad person. And remember above all that a wolf in his own skin is immeasurably more honest than the same animal under a sheep's clothing. Again, very important to remember in these times. Liberty, non-essential liberty. Cultivating feelings of brotherly love, sympathy. It's also important, it's also essential, not just important. So this indeed should be our holy grail and we should be fully aware of the importance of the Theosophical Society and its work in the world today, which is just as essential now as ever. So just a quote with another quote from H.P. Blavatsky. No one is so busy or so poor that he cannot be inspired by a noble ideal to follow. Why hesitate to blaze a trail towards that ideal through all obstacles and hindrances, all the daily considerations of social life, and to advance boldly until it is reached. Ah, those who have made this effort would soon find that the narrow gate and the thorny path lead to spacious valleys with unlimited horizons, to a state without death, for one re becomes a god. It is true that the first requisite for getting there our absolute unselfishness and unlimited devotion to the interests of others and complete indifference as to the world and its opinions. Take note of that, complete indifference to the world and its opinions. To take the first step on this ideal path requires a perfectly pure motive. No frivolous thought must be allowed to divert our eyes from the goal. No hesitation, no doubt must fetter our feet. Yet there are men and women perfectly capable of all this and whose only desire is to live under the aegis of their divine nature. Let these at least have the courage to live this life and not to hide it from the sight of others. No one's opinion could ever be above the rulings of our own conscience. So let that conscience, arrived at its highest development, be our guide in all our common daily tasks. As to our inner life, let us concentrate all our attention on our chosen ideal and let us ever look beyond without ever casting a glance at the mud at our feet. Well, some of those things seem very hard, difficult to live up to, but to give us something to work towards. I think we always should, I think WQ Judge talks about being a bit like an arrow, shooting an arrow. You have to aim higher than your actual target. And, you know, that, that gives you the motivation to, uh, to um, hit that target eventually. Otherwise, if you just stay on the same level, you would never really progress. You have to always aim for something a little bit higher and work towards it and do, and do your best. So anyway, thank you for listening. Um, hopefully, I'll see you again very shortly for the, ne for the next talk. And we'll just finish the little meditation and then I'll blow out the candles of harmony. So once again, I'll sound the, the um, Tibetan singing bowl.
Thank you. If there are no questions, no, then I'll bring the meeting to a close. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace. Peace on earth and goodwill to all beings. Thank you and see you next time.